So as Maggie said, my name is Jeff Vagon. I am the land steward at Urban Ecology Center. I've been with the UEC since 2011, where I started at Riverside Park seasonally uh, for two years. And then starting in 2013, I came over here to be the sole land steward of Three Bridges Park. This park is uh it's pretty amazing if you don't know you should definitely come down to the south side it is a 24 acre uh restoration site that is built on a brown field and we completely um made something out of nothing so this is this is very exciting uh today we are going to be talking about the work that has happened in three bridges park over the last eight years but most important we're going to be talking a little about the vegetation surveys that I've been doing. So as land steward, my responsibility is the day-to-day -day land management activity in Three Bridges Park. So I um, oversee all of the plantings, all of the invasive removal, any erosion control, trail maintenance, working with volunteers, supervising and managing interns, a whole lot of stuff, giving tours, presentations, all that, all that fun stuff. On top of the active land management activities, I've also been responsible for overseeing and observing the progress that we have been making in Three Bridges Park. And we do that by doing vegetation surveys. So this is super exciting. It's actually the first time that I've publicly uh, presented about vegetation surveys. So yay for everyone joining in today. We'll also be talking about uh, the long-term goals of Three Bridges Park. Like I said, this park is brand new. It's only about nine years old. And if you know, prairies and woodlands and savannas take a lot longer than nine years to, uh, to establish. So we have a long-term um, plan for Three Bridges Park, and I will be talking about that towards the end. As Maggie said, if you have any questions, post them into the chat, and we will go over them towards the end of the presentation. So a little history about Menominee Valley. Uh, the Menominee Valley is an area of Milwaukee that has been heavily used by industry. It is an area that is roughly um, north boundary of St. Paul Avenue, south boundary of National Avenue. The east boundary is right around where the Harley Davidson Museum is, and the western boundary is uh, what was Miller Park. American Family Fields, got to get used to saying that. So it's a very large area of Milwaukee. It's right along where the Menominee River uh, runs through. And this area um, historically, like I said, was used for industry. There was a lot of um, railroad shops on here. The Milwaukee Road Shops took a majority of the area um, of, of the Menominee Valley, but there's other businesses such as foundries and tanneries. Uh, Cream City Brick was made down here for a while. Five Star Yeast, there's a whole lot of different industries that came in and um, established themselves and moved on. But as a whole, it was a lot of dirty industry. It was a lot of industry that was putting contaminants into the soil. And this whole area of, of Milwaukee became uh, pretty smelly, actually. It was, uh, there was a stench because of how much pollutants were in this area. But over the last 25, 30 years, there has been a lot of work um, being put into the Menominee Valley. One of the um, partners, Menominee Valley Partners, they are a nonprofit that's been working with the city to revitalize the Menominee Valley. And in their time of existence, um, they've developed more than 300 acres of brownfield, uh, more than 50 companies of diverse industry have come in, such as hotels and entertainment, manufacturing, food and drink. Um, and then also 60 plus acres of natural space and trails. 
have been installed into the Menominee Valley. And what was the heart of Milwaukee where a lot of jobs and businesses were is now again, uh, one, of the, one of the beating hearts of Milwaukee. And it's, it's an absolute privilege to work in this area. Uh, this is just another picture of the Menominee Valley. So as you can see, this is all the Menominee Valley here. So where the pointer is, this is where the Brewers play. This is Harley Davidson over here. Here's the interstate roughly, and this is National Avenue. This section right here is Three Bridges Park. Three Bridges Park is 24 acres. And when we first acquired this land as uh, the site for a future restoration project, this is what it looked like. It was a massive mound of degraded soil. It was called Airline Yards because this is where the Milwaukee Road Shops actually worked on a lot of the air brakes for their cars. So it was unofficially titled Airline Yards. As you can see, well, you can't really see because this picture doesn't do it justice. This is a massive pile of soil. It was filled with debris, rubble, concrete, fill, and a majority of the soil uh, was brought to this site when the Marquette Interchange project was being built. We were the lovely recipients of of all that soil because the site that Airline Yards is, um, it's owned by the city of Milwaukee. It was used by uh, railroad. So the Wisconsin Department of Transportation kind of had oversight. So when the market interchange project was being built, they had to find other areas that were um, city owned and managed or oversaw by the DOT. And we were the lovely recipients of that soil. Here's another picture of, of Three Bridges Park. This is taken from uh, Airline Yard. It's not Three Bridges Park yet. Uh, this was taken from 35th Street Viaduct. So this project, 24 acres, had a dream to create um, natural space, create uh, native plant communities that were typically found in this part of the state pre-European settlement. There was a lot of work that went into making airline yards into Three Bridges Park. Uh, and a lot of that work was done by Urban Ecology Center, Menominee Valley Partners, the city of Milwaukee, the county, the state, um, which specifically the DNR. And together we raised about 40 or about $24 million to bring in the Urban Ecology Center to the south side to create Three Bridges Park. And you can see on the map, it goes from uh, roughly 35th Street Viaduct to the Mitchell Park Domes at 27th Street. It built about three quarters of a mile of the Hank Aaron State Trail spur that goes through Three Bridges Park. And it also paid for a lot of the restoration and a lot of the earth moving that happened in Three Bridges Park. There's other funds that um, were allocated for various other things, but $24 million roughly to create this project. The plan for this project was to bring in native plant communities that you would typically find in Southeastern Wisconsin, pre-European settlement. So the majority of the uh, plant communities that we have in this area are Southern Music Forest. Southern Music Forest are Sugar Maple, American Beech, American Basswood are the dominant trees. There's other trees that are associated with that. Um, but that's the, that was the dominant plant community in Milwaukee County. Talking about Southeast Wisconsin as a whole, then you start incorporating prairies and woodlands and savannas. Um, 
So we are incorporating all three of those plant communities into Three Bridges Park. One of the reasons why we are bringing so many different plant communities and not just making it a Southern music forest, which would historically um, be found in Milwaukee County. As the Urban Ecology Center, we are educating uh, the community around us, the families around us um, about plant communities that they might not necessarily have the opportunity to go visit. They might not be able to get to Southwest Wisconsin where you have amazing grasslands uh, sprawling or go up to Northern Wisconsin where you have dense forest areas. So we are trying to bring in as many of these plant communities into our restoration project so we can engage and teach about these plant communities um, to the community and the area that we serve in. So how do we keep all of this, um, all of this straight? We, we have developed um, an internal, this is all internal. This is what I use when I am managing Three Bridges Park. It's a map showing all of the plant communities that are intended, I'll get to that in a second, um, that are intended to be in Three Bridges Park. And you can see each of these red outlines have numbers. These are all management units um, that I can keep organized where we've been working, what we've been doing, uh, what we've been planting, what we've been removing, all that day-to-day -day activity is all documented in these smaller uh, management units to help be um, help me to be a little bit more methodical and um, efficient with my time. So how did we get to Three Bridges Park from Airline Yards? We moved a lot of soil, all the soil that was on site. We used that to create seven mounds uh, in the 24 acres of Three Bridges Park. We hired contractors to do all the earth moving, all of um, the grading work, building the Hank Aaron State Trail. This is pictures of the construction currently happening um, in 20, let's see, this was in 2012, 2011, 2012. After all, all the hills were graded, we then started um, seeding and doing a lot of the initial plantings of Three Bridges Park. So we spread seed of roughly 65 species, all native to Southeast Wisconsin. A majority of these species were cover crop, annual, and biennial plants. Um, and that was to quickly establish the, the soil, because as you can see, there was nothing out here. It's full sun. And we wanted to make sure that um, what we were building and what we were constructing was going to um, stabilize very, very quickly. What wasn't shown in this picture was a lot of burlap. After the construction was um, done, all the earth moving was done and the seeding happened, we actually laid burlap over a um, vast majority of the property to help keep the seed in place, uh, to help prevent weed seed from coming in and essentially to hold the soil in place before all of the plants were um we're establishing during the initial planting not only did we spread a lot of seed that was mostly prairie seed this is all um full sun plant community so it was all prairie seed we also planted 42 burr oak trees that were spread out throughout the entire um, park project and those trees were planted in a way to create um oak savannas eventually. Along with the, the oak trees, about a thousand quaking aspen trees were planted in various areas. And in those areas, it was intended to be woodland. And quaking aspen is an early successional poplar tree. Um, it's related to cottonwoods, which are very common in wet growing areas. 
quaking aspens grow in a little bit drier areas. So we use those as our early successional forest trees. Once all the, the seeding was done, um, that's where I kind of started doing my work in Three Bridges Park. There was contractors that were hired to do a lot of the initial planting within Three Bridges Park, but it was part of our plan to incorporate the community and incorporate volunteers as much as we could um, throughout the entire project. So as construction was happening and as contractors were planting plants and trees out in the park, we were working in other and smaller parts of Three Bridges Park where we could engage volunteers. And some of, the, um, some of my volunteers have been with me ever since the beginning of Three Bridges Park. And the three that are pictured in um, this picture still currently volunteer with me. And it's, it's not only uh, a cool thing for me to see this project actually come from nothing, but it's amazing to see the volunteers that have um, been volunteering with me for eight years and seeing the work that they're doing and seeing the um, progress that's being made. And when I say the work that they're doing, I really mean that Three Bridges Park is being built by volunteers. I wouldn't be able to do all of the work that I'm doing without um, the help of thousands of volunteer hours per year. So over the last eight years, uh, we have been planting roughly 100,000 plants. It was a little over 100,000 plants as of this year. That's including herbaceous plants, woody plants such as shrubs and trees and grass-like plants. We have um, removed and worked on non-native invasive species throughout the park. We have done trail maintenance. We've collected seed and we have spread seed out in Three Bridges Park. We have done tree trimming. We have worked in the community gardens and the natural areas around the community gardens, utilizing many, many volunteers. Um, we have uh, thinned out some trees. So over the last eight years, when, um, when we've been working, the quaking aspen have actually been filling in. So we've been thinning them out and planting in other tree species to incorporate into those future woodland areas. And then some of the smaller things that, um, that a lot of people don't realize is we have so many volunteers that come out on a weekly basis and do trash pickup and um, make sure that the trails are, are cleared and safe and open to the public. And that's one aspect of, of my job that doesn't typically um, come forward because I'm always, I'm working on, on the plants, but as I'm out there, I'm also working with volunteers to just keep the park safe and accessible. And then this was a, a picture that we took. So the three people that were in the very first picture are also in this picture and we kind of uh, did it in the same fashion. It was kind of fun. So this, this picture is eight years after the initial. Some other um, management practices that we've been doing in Three Bridges Park has been going to other properties such as DNR land and state land and county land to collect seed. So we are going to remnant prairies or remnant savannas or woodlands and we are getting seed source from those areas. So we get permission to collect um, a very small quantity of seed from these areas. And this is to incorporate the indigenous plant biodiversity into our plantings. So we'll purchase plants from nurseries and we'll purchase seed from nurseries. 
but we also want to ensure that we are um, getting as much genetic diversity into our restoration sites as possible. So the prairie that we are at in this picture, um, this is myself and a couple fellow land stewards from a couple of years ago. This is at Lapham Peak, one of the one of the units in the southern Kettle Moraine Forest. Beautiful area. We've been going and collecting seed from there for the last uh, five years now. Some of the other areas have been Scuppernong, Chiwaki Prairie. Um, we've gone to Kettle Moraine North, Old Bluff, all these, all these various areas. And we're collecting seed from similar plant communities, but each of the plants have a little bit of a genetic difference to it. That's important because that is protecting our plant community from any potential diseases that could come through. Say a disease comes through and affects, you know, a certain genetic plant. If you only have one genetic, you know, unique plant, that disease could wipe out an entire, you know, plant community pretty quickly. But by having all this genetic diversity and all this um, plant source coming into the restoration project, we're actually creating a very um, sustainable and healthy plant community as we're restoring this. So we collect seed, incorporate lots of genetic diversity. We also do prescribed burns on in Three Bridges Park. So a prescribed burn is the intentional setting of fire uh, to mostly prairie and savanna land. This picture was taken a few years ago. You can see um, that we have a crew out there. We, we contract um, with restoration companies to, to do the prescribed burn for us because they have the training and they have um, the expertise and also the insurance to cover it. But what they're doing is they're methodically setting fire to our prairies, and that is removing all of last year's vegetation. Um, fires are typically done in the springtime after, after the snow has melted and the plants are still in a state of um, dormancy, meaning that they're, they haven't actively grown. There's this window where we are able to do prescribed burns. And you have to have pretty good weather conditions. The weather, um, it can't be too windy. It can't be uh, too calm. You actually need some wind to carry a fire, but you also need to have the right humidity, um, right light conditions. There's so much that goes into a prescribed burn. And when all of those a line, you're actually able to conduct it. And it's pretty exciting. Another, another management practice that we, that we utilize is smothering. This is also within Three Bridges Park. The viaduct um, in the background of the picture is 27th Street. This, this is a, a method that we use when we want to kill off a, a non-native invasive plant that is taking up a smaller area um, or an area that is mostly that plant. So the plant that we're smothering here is purple crown vetch and uh, Kentucky bluegrass. They're both non-native invasive plants. Purple crown vetch is actively planted to um, control erosion when new roads are built. So it's, it grows very, very quickly. It establishes and it spreads. And unfortunately, after it's planted next to roadways and highways, it establishes itself in natural areas. So it's a very common plant that is found in many restoration sites, but it's a very, very problematic plant. Kentucky bluegrass, as you know, is a turf grass that we plant in our yards. 
And that plant is also um, problematic in natural areas because it's um, mat growing, meaning that it creates a monoculture. As you know, your turf grass, your lawns are all um, perfectly uniform. Maybe not yours. This is a this is a group of people that probably don't have uh, uniform yards, but if you go in many parts of neighborhoods, neighborhoods all around the country, you find turf grass after turf grass after turf grass lawns. And when that gets into natural areas, it also becomes problematic. So we're smothering this out. Smothering is a pretty long process. You actually have to smother it for an entire growing season. And then throughout the growing season, you pull up the fabric, you allow a new seed bank of those plants to emerge, and then you roll it back down. One of the, one of the challenges with doing smothering is it kills everything. So even if you have native plants in here, you're killing everything and you basically have to start at um, square one. So I don't typically like doing smothering, um, but sometimes you have to. Another management practice that we do is actually infrastructure. It's, it's creating trails, it's creating walking paths. In this case, we are uh, creating a boardwalk that overlooks um, the little pond in Three Bridges Park, Dragonfly Pond. All of these infrastructures are helping us maintain our plant communities. If we allow or if we um, set up walking paths and we provide trails for people to go to the tops of the hills and look at uh, the wildlife in the pond, we're giving them a path that's designated and it's not just a free reign. So it helps us um, mitigate any sort of compaction that happens when people create their own paths. It also allows us um, to create paths in a way that gets people to a, a cool site of, of the skyline, but also in a purposeful way that protects some of the plants and some of the plant communities that we're trying to establish in Three Bridges Park. So it's 2021. We've been creating Three Bridges Park now for the last eight years. If you've gone out to Three Bridges Park, you can see that it is very full of plants. It is very diverse. And how do we know that we are actually doing a good job? How do we know that what we intended for Three Bridges Park is progressing in a way um, that we're hoping that we, that we wanted to do? The only way that we can do that on a scientific level is by doing vegetation surveys. Vegetation surveys are a method that we use to look at the plants out in Three Bridges Park and to quantify how many plants we have and also um, quantify how much that plant, that individual plant is taking up in Three Bridges Park. So this is the, the transect that we use. So each vegetation plot, as you can see, there are three, um, actually five little dots right here. Each of those dots is a subplot that's part of the full vegetation survey plot. So this is gonna hopefully not be too confusing. Um, but for the sake of this conversation, when I say plot, I'm actually talking about an individual one, um, even though it's called a subplot. But for this, when I talk about a plot, it's one of these individual um, points. So the transect is 20 meters long and it's six meters wide. And this line is what we call an azimuth. An azimuth is the degree of north. 
So we have um, 42 vegetation plots, and I'll show you a map in a second, that are randomly placed throughout Three, three Bridges Park. 42 vegetation plots, each one of them consisting of five plots. Um, I should have done the math, but that's a lot of that's a lot of plots out there. And what we're what we're doing is each one of these little points is a one meter squared um, area that we are looking at every single plant that's growing. The form that we use is this one. It, it shows the date. Um, which is very important, who's taking the vegetation survey. 99% um, of the time, it is myself and summer interns. It's a, it's a great way to build um, a base knowledge of plants and really get close to the plants and identify plants on a, on a very small level. We write down what plot it is and then the subplot. So. This could be plot 102, for example, and this would be subplot one. The azimuth is that line that the five that the five plots are aligned on, and that azimuth is randomly created as well. So not only do we have these plots that are randomly placed throughout Three Bridges Park, they're in a direction of north that is also random. So we're trying to keep this as um, unsubjective and subjective, unsubjective as we can. For each one of these one meter square areas, we are identifying every single plant that we see. Whether it is a new seedling, whether it's a plant that's six feet tall, if it falls within that one meter square area, we are identifying it. After we identify a plant, we give it a cover class here. So the cover class is how much space is that individual plant species taking up? So not just like one stem, but say we have Canada goldenrod and you have a one meter square area and there's 25 individual Canada goldenrod plants in there. We, in theory, take all those plants in our mind and push it together and we figure out how much actual area of that one meter square is being taken up by Canada goldenrod. And we give it a cover class. Zero is absent, but then one being present, that's typically if it's a new seedling that's just emerging or a very, very, very small plant, typically only one individual, we use that. And then we go into 25% um, after that. We, we decided to go with this method of 6 to 25, 26 to 50, 51, 75, 76 to 100, because it takes away some of the subjectivity of the researcher doing the survey. So when I go out and do the survey, I can have an idea of how much area this plant takes up. And I might give Canada Goldenrod uh, six to 25 percent, a two. But a summer intern or another land steward or another land manager, they might come out and and give it a cover class of, of three. So there's a little bit of subjectivity when we do this. We picked these 25 percent ranges because it takes away some of the subjectivity. A lot of other or some other vegetation surveys are actually broken down into 10% um, ranges. What that gives you is a little bit more specific and exact percentage of how much area a plant is taken up, but it gives you also a higher degree of um, user error as it comes to multiple people doing the vegetation surveys. So that was the reason that we went with this, um, this percentage. After we identify every single plant and give it a cover class, you'll notice that it doesn't equal 100%. This is a 3D kind of 
area. So it's not just one meter squared, it's one meter squared plus the height. Um, and you can have plants that are growing other growing over other plants. You can have plants that are entwined with other plants. So it, it never equals 100% to it. After you do all of that, we then look at the ground features. So non-vegetative aspects of these plants. And that could be moss, water, like standing water if we were doing a plot that's next to a pond or next to the river, um, bare dirt, coarse woody material. So this could be large um, limbs, sticks from trees, mulch or wood chips. This was important because um, initially when Three Bridges Park was built, some areas had compost that was mixed into it and that compost had wood chips. Rock or gravel that is large enough to inhibit plants from growing, whether uh, the plot is located on, on pavement. So if it's on the Hank Aaron State Trail that runs through Three Bridges Park, then you have leaf litter, which is also called duff. That's any um, old last year's plant material that's from a wooded area. And then lastly, thatch which is last year's plant material that's from a prairie area. So um, grass, stems, all that kind of stuff. After you do that, you then tally um, any tree that is less than two centimeters in diameter. And you identify that, you say how many individual trees there are, and then you indicate if there's any browsing from mammals, um, small mammals, deer, that kind. So this is this isn't a great map. Um, it's kind of faded. It's the best that I that I have. But this is a map of Three Bridges Park, and you can see that there's individual points right here. Those are all um, vegetation survey plots. Each one of these plots is the five subplots together. This plot here, you can see it has a red line. That's the azimuth. So that's the degree of north that it was found for that, that plot. Uh, this, this is another picture of Three Bridges Park. This is closer to 33rd Court or halfway into um, Three Bridges Park. If you're heading from the west, you can see that there's additional plots here, some with azimuth lines already established, some do not have azimuth lines. And then here is uh, another, this is right before or just west of 27th Street Viaduct. So this just shows that the plots are randomly placed throughout the park. You wanna have as many of the areas of your of your restoration project covered by vegetation surveys, because that's gonna give you the best um, data for distribution and how plants are actually spaced out and spread out through the entire park. When I go out and do vegetation surveys, since I've been doing them in Three Bridges Park now for the last eight years, I'm, I can do them pretty, Pretty quickly, I have a really good idea of what, what the plants are out in Three Bridges Park. I can identify them on a pretty small level, but that was not always the case. So when we would go out and do vegetation surveys, I would bring out many, many different field guides. Um, I have field guides that are specific to only grasses. Grasses and sedges are notorious for being um, sometimes impossible to, to identify. So we have these um, vegetation guides that we bring with us to help us identify something out in the field. We also have some books that are just for um, forbs or flowering plants that we bring out. And then I also have a book to help me identify new seedlings. So any plant that is just emerging um, that doesn't have any flowers on it, that's typically a first or second year plant, 
this book helps me identify that plant um, with the characteristics that are found of those very, very small plants. All right. So over the course of 2013 to 2018, 2013 was the year that I started. Um, that's when Three Bridges Park had its grand opening. During uh, these six years, we conducted vegetation surveys of eight of the 43 plots. So we only did eight because they are very, very time consuming. And we didn't want to just jump in and do 43 all the first year and then realize that we're going to get burnt out. So we kind of built in a, a gradient as to when we're going to incorporate new vegetation survey plots. So for the first six years, we did eight plots. They were, um, they were randomly selected throughout the entire park. So we have plots that are on the far west end of the park, and we have plots that are on the far east of the park. They're just spaced very, very far apart. Um, in 2013, we identified 138 plants, um, not individual species, but in the eight plots with the five subplots, we identified 138 plants. Um, there was a breakdown of roughly 51%, not roughly, I guess it was 51% native plants and 49% were non-native plants. Of those non-native plants, most of them were tertiary weeds that don't really pose a significant um, challenge to land managers as, as the work continues because they typically kind of go away as native plants or more um, hardy plants kind of establish themselves. So first year, we identified 138 plants. We actually identified 31 species of, of plants out in Three Bridges Park. Um, 14 of those species were native, 17 were non-native. As I said, most of the non-native were tertiary weeds that come in and leave. Um, and then some of the most common plants of that year were black-eyed Susan, um, purple prairie clover, um, and cover crops. The cover crops were annual oats, annual flax, and annual rye. Those were the three most common plants. Jumping to 2016, we found 338 plants. Of the 338 plants that we found, we actually identified 47 different species. So we, we found new species um, emerging that we didn't see in 2013. Of the 47, we found 34 native species and only 13 non-native species. So already in the four years, we were seeing a trend of increasing native plants and a decrease of non-native plants, which is one of our main goals. In 2016, what we found to be the most um, abundant were grasses. So we had lots of Canada wild rye that was in Three Bridges Park. Canada wild rye is an early successional grass that's native. It's a short-lived perennial grass. And what it's doing is it's holding the ground, it's creating organic material in the soil, and it's allowing other plants to, um, to establish that need a little bit more organic matter. So there's a lot of grasses out in Three Bridges Park. We also had a lot of purple prairie clover again. So we had a lot of purple prairie clover in 2013. We also had a lot of it in 2016. Purple prairie clover is in the legume family. So it's a bean or a pea. Those are important because they are nitrogen fixing. Plants need nitrogen to grow 
And most plants take in nitrogen from the soil, but legumes um, incorporate nitrogen back into the soil because of uh, interaction with a fungus that grows on their root systems, and they're actually allowed to put nitrogen into the into the soil for other plants to use. So purple prairie clover was very important in Three Bridges Park. Um, and then jumping to 2018, we had 48 species. So from 2016 to 2018, we had a little bit of a plateau of of new plants that we were finding. We had an increase of native plants. We went from 34 plants that were native to 36 plants. Um, we had a drop in non-native. So we had 13 in 2016 and we had 12 in uh, 2018. So again, even though the, the plateau of total species happened, there was still an increase of, of native plant species to non-native plant species, which is what we wanted. But what we also started seeing on the bottom of this chart, you can see there's these percentages. Um, it, the peak of the abundance of native to non-native happened in 2016, where we had 90% of our observations be native plants and only 10% of the observations in Three Bridges Park were non-native plants. But then starting in 2017 and then going into 2018, we saw uh, the abundance of non-native plants starting to increase. Uh, there was, there was quite a few reasons for this. A lot of it happened because there were new um, non-native invasive plants that were showing up in Three Bridges Park. And those non-native invasive plants not only establish themselves on bare soil, but they start to outcompete other, um, other native plants and other plants that are growing in the area, and they take up a little bit more space. So we started seeing an increase of non-native invasive plants starting in 2018, or starting in 2017 and going into 2018. This is just um, some pie charts to show a nice visual of how the native to non-native has changed in those three years. Now, back in the vegetation surveys, I talked about um, bare soil. Bare soil is very important because if you have bare soil, you have a tendency to have increased erosion issues. So we wanted to make sure that not only were native plants increasing over the course of the years of restoration work, um, and the non-native plant species were decreasing. We also wanted to ensure that the amount of bare soil and the amount of prone areas for erosion was decreasing. And the number on the left-hand side, the y-axis, that's giving it the cover class that we use in the vegetation survey. So in 2013, over 75% of the park was bare soil. That is a huge number. Um, the, the park had a very slow going at first. It went from over 75% to between 50 and 75% until 2016. And then we started seeing a little bit of a decrease in that. Obviously, there are multiple reasons why fair soil um, was persistent in the beginning we started from nothing. It's a construction site. So you would expect that there was a lot of bare soil in the first few years. But then there's the saying goes for native plants and it's the first year a native plant sleeps. This is when it's growing from a seed. So the first year it sleeps and that plant is putting a lot of its energy into a root system on the first year. Uh, the second year it creeps. So it's still putting a lot of energy into the root system, but it's now starting to grow a little bit bigger on the surface. The leaves are getting a little bit bigger. But then in the third year, it leaps. And that's when it starts putting a lot of its energy into above ground growth, and it starts creating flowers, seeds, and whatnot. Um, 
So over the course of the first six years, we, we figured that in the first few years, there would be a lot of bare soil, but then as those native seeds are germinating and growing over time, uh, the bare soil would decrease. Now, looking at 2021, so we didn't do any vegetation surveys in uh, 2019 or 2020. We took a couple years um, of a break. We did vegetation survey plots again this year. We increased the number of plots that we did this year from eight plots in 2018 to 20 plots in 2021. So we identified um, 100 meter squared areas throughout Three Bridges Park. And what we found in 2021 was 77%, uh, the chart on the left-hand side, 77% of our observations were native plants, 23% were non-native plants. So the, the observation levels again dropped a little bit. And again, this is because we are now seeing um, more non native plants establishing, more non native invasive plants establishing and taking up larger areas. But still, 77% of the park is comprised of native plants. The pie chart on the right hand side is a breakdown of native to non-native and species actively managed. So the blue is native and we had 67 native species observed in our vegetation surveys this year. And we had um, 52 non-native uh, species observed. But of the 52 species observed, only 16 of them are ones that we actively manage. So they are the um, most problematic plants that we have out there. Purple crown veg, reed canary grass, garlic mustard, um, common buckthorn. Those are all ones that are highly invasive and highly problematic. So 36 are those tertiary weeds, tertiary non-native plants that come in, that go as other plants establish themselves and essentially they are cover class or cover crop um, taking up bare soil. So overall, 2021 um, has a really high ratio of native plants and non-problematic plants throughout Three Bridges Park. And then in 2021, we also saw an increase of, of bare soil that, that could have been due to minor erosion that was happening. Um, some of the plants that were found early in the season or early in the years of the survey, um, they might've disappeared. Some of the cover uh, crops might've disappeared. Some of the annual plants might've disappeared and have now created bare soil. Um, but it wasn't too much of an issue. It's still, within the 25 or the um, six to 25%. So it's a very low number, low percentage of um, bare soil throughout through Bridges Park. So what does this mean? When we look at this, what does this tell us? Over the last six years or eight years, seven surveys, um, it told us that from 2013 to 2021, we saw an increase of, of native plants found in Three Bridges Park. We found an increase of native plant observations, meaning that they are distributed at a higher uh, rate than our non-native plants. We saw a decrease of non-native plants. And relatively speaking, we saw a decrease of bare soil throughout Three Bridges Park. We also saw an increase of leaf litter in Three Bridges Park. This was important because now leaf litter is being incorporated into the park. It is breaking down. It is adding um, organic material and a lot of beneficial um, interactions between a de decomposing layer that's on top of the soil and the soil. So we saw an increase of leaf litter. 
and we saw an increase of of thatch, which is the prairie material. Now we had an increase um, in 2017 and 2018. When we did our survey in 2018, it was right after we did a prescribed burn, and most and the plots that we um, that we did in 2018 were actually part of the prescribed burn. So there was no thatch that year, but in 2017 there was actually thatch, but it just doesn't show it here. So we saw a lot um, of an increase of thatch, which is also very very important um, for building a a very healthy ecosystem with um, plants, wildlife, and then also the uh, fungus and plant decomposing interactions that, that you see in plant communities. That takes us to 2022. So what are we looking for? Um, what are some of the things that we wanna do in order to continue the work on, on the path that we're going, we have a, a management plan that we have created that basically lays out what this park is gonna look like in the next five to 10 years, what it's gonna look like in the next 10 to 30 years. And then lastly, what is this park gonna look like 50, 100, 150 years? from now as these oak trees mature, as these woodlands progress, and as um, these savannas progress. So in the first three to five years, so looking at 2022 um, and then going into 2027, I guess, we are going to continue actively managing for the non-native invasive species. The ones that we have most prominently in Three Bridges Park are purple crown vetch, oxide daisy, common St. John's wort, Phragmites, it's also called common reed grass. Those are, those are the four most problematic um, plants. We want to make sure that we're keeping those non-native invasive plants um, in check or reducing their population if we can. We also want to uh, continue managing Fruit Bridges Park um, for the most part as a prairie. So we are gonna be conducting prescribed burns. We wanna make sure that any um, volunteer tree that comes in, such as a cottonwood, a box elder, or an ash tree that grow very, very well in open sun, we wanna make sure that they're not gonna be out competing the prairie plants uh, that we have out there. So we'll be doing prescribed burns that kill off those trees. We also will be cutting down and herbiciding trees if we need to. And then starting this year, 2022, we are going to be um, having some woodlands become more um, established. So we're going to be stopping any prescribed burns in these areas. One of the areas that we're not going to be burning is the hill right behind Mitchell Park Dome on the far east side of the park. So from 27th Street East, that whole hill is beginning is going to become a woodland area. So we are no longer going to be doing prescribed burns out there, and we're going to allow all those volunteer tree species to establish themselves. With not doing a burn, you still want to maintain um, the, the ground layer. You still want to maintain um, a level of thatch or leaf litter. So we're going to be starting a mowing cycle instead of doing a burn. And this year we started planting some more tree species out there. So we started planting sugar maple, American basswood, and American beech, because those are the three dominant trees of a southern music forest that we are creating in Three Bridges Park. Looking at 10 to 30 years now, we're still going to be doing all the things that we were doing in the three to five years. Um, but now we're going to be looking at some of these plant communities such as woodlands and savannas that take a long time to establish. And we're gonna start monitoring at the progress of that establishment. What we might find is these plant communities that we are wanting to be in Three Bridges Park as a woodland or savanna, they might not be establishing. The site just might not um, be suitable for those plant communities. So we're gonna be monitoring the progress of these plant communities 
As we're monitoring, we're going to be maintaining those areas as wooded savanna or prairie areas. And we're going to be incorporating additional plant species into these areas. Again, we're always going to have to continue monitoring for non-native invasive plants. And we're always going to have to work at keeping those at bay. And then lastly, um, 50 years from now, maybe I'll still be here. I don't know. I hope so. I, I hope I'm around Milwaukee and I hope I'm still in Milwaukee to see what this park is going to look like in 50 years because it's going to be magnificent. If the prairies, the savannas, and the woodlands all establish themselves, it's going to be a beautiful place. And in those 50 years, the, the tree canopy of these sugar maples, basswoods, they're going to establish themselves in these southern music forests. And we're going to start um, seeing a lot of understory growth happening. We're going to be planting um, understory shrubs, such as rose species, dogwoods. We're going to be planting hazelnuts, um, lead plant that grows in savanna areas. And then we're going to continue maintaining the prairie areas as prairie areas by conducting prescribed burns again and continuing to keep an open plant or an open canopy for the sun loving plants. So we're going to be removing any of the invasive woody species such as common buckthorn, honeysuckle, uh, and European spindle tree. With that, I am done with my presentation.